In this next module, I'm going to talk about uh, communicating with the media and with the general public about your work. So after you've gotten some publications in the literature, oftentimes you will get contacted eventually by a journalist who's interested in your work. Even if you don't have something in science or nature, sometimes when you've got a paper uh, even in a, you know, a, a lesser impact journal, sometimes it can be something that's of general interest and you may be contacted by a journalist who wants to talk with you about the work. And in general, it's a good opportunity to share uh, you know your work with the public so so it's a it's a great thing to be interviewed by uh, by a journalist and to get to talk with the media uh, in the next module after this module i actually have a panel discussion where i'm talking with three of my former students who have ha actually done had numerous encounters with the media and they're going to give you some advice and some tips about how to be interviewed by a journalist so i'm going to keep this module short and i'm going to because you're going to get a lot of advice from them in, in the next module but i spend a lot of time um, i do a lot of science journalism so i actually do a lot of interviews so i'm just going to tell you a little bit from the interviewer's uh, perspective and also give you some tips for um, specifically how to talk about numbers with journalists and the lay public. So a few things to keep in mind when you're being interviewed by a journalist. So what is it that journalists are looking for? So when I'm interviewing a scientist, I obviously, I want to understand the science. That's, that's paramount. I want to understand what's going on with the science. And so I may have some very specific questions that I ask the journalist to help clarify some of the science if I, if I don't understand it. Beyond understanding the science, however, I have to write uh, an interesting and compelling story about the, the work. And so some things that I'm looking for in my interview is I'd like the researcher to give me a sense of some big picture ties. What's the overall significance of the work? That's very helpful for me in crafting my story. I also want to know, of course, how the research, of, research affects people. So if you're doing something in basic research, it's nice to be able to tell the journalist, you know, how might this affect your readers, even in the long term? What is the, why is this important? Why might this be important to, uh, to the readers of, this, um, of the, the media outlet? Um, also, uh, journalists have to write about new things. They have to have a news hook. There's some reason why it's being written about now. So if you can tell the journalist what's different or new about your results, what distinguishes it from previous studies, that's very helpful. I'll just uh, give you sort of a, a, a warning here that um, uh, when I'm interviewing somebody, if they use some nice, colorful language, I'm often going to directly quote them on that because, of course, I have to write up an interesting and engaging story. So colorful prose, you know, a, makes a great quote to throw in the article. So just be a little bit careful because if you do use colorful prose, it's great. Uh, journalists love it. Uh, but if you use something that's, you know, like very harsh or, or um, you know, that might end up in the article if it's very colorful. So just keep that in mind. We, we really want you to use good language. Um, just uh, be a little bit careful. Um, interesting stories, anecdotes, like how did you happen to come up with the idea for the study? Those are great things to write up in a story, uh, in a media story that are of general interest. So that'll often make it into the story. Anything that's surprising, paradox, irony, that uh, journalists love that because that actually makes the story really compelling. So if you were, you know, going out to, um, uh, find a, you were trying to find a, uh, a weight loss drug and it turned out that you ended up finding a, a cancer drug. You know, that's an interesting type of story that you might share with the journalist. Uh, journalists are looking for people-focused stories. So even if you're doing something in basic research, they always want to know how does that tie back to their readers. So they're going to ask you that. Uh, if you've got some uh, facts that are interesting, historical facts uh, about the research, the history of the research or the development of the idea, that's always interesting for a story. Um, if um, you can give some kind of sweeping comment about the significance of your work, researcher uh, journalists are looking for that. You, you always, as a journalist, need kind of a first quote for your piece and a, kind of a sweeping comment about the significance of the work makes a great uh, first quote. And sometimes you'll be asked um, to be interviewed as a commentator on a peer's research. That may happen. And uh, if you give, you know, if you point out the controversies or you give very, um, bold criticisms or laudatory praise, that's likely to make it in the article. So, you know, of course, you want to be a little bit careful about that because if you say something very uh, critical or very laudatory, that, that will likely make it into the article. So these are the kinds of things that the, the journalist is looking for. They, of course, want to hear about the science, uh, but they'll, the, the journalist will usually ask you if there's specific parts of the science that they want clarified. Uh, otherwise, they're not necessarily wanting to hear all the jargon uh, because that's not easy to quote you on. Remember, they're oftentimes looking for direct quotes. And if you put too much jargon in, it's hard to, to make a direct quote out of that. 
So my general suggestions for if you're going to be interviewed, and again, um, in the next module, I'll talk with three of my former students, and they'll give you some more tips about being interviewed. So I'll just get, go through this briefly. But the first thing is, and uh, is that you want to generally be prepared. So think ahead of time about the things that you want to get across uh, to the journalist, and and craft your message a little bit. You can, uh, if it's the first time you're being interviewed, if you want to ask the journalist if they can send you the questions ahead of time, oftentimes they're willing to do that so that it can help you to be prepared. Uh, again, avoid jargon. The, the journalist is generally looking for things that they can directly quote you on, and if it has too much jargon, they, they can't do that. Uh, so uh, you're often told to, to pretend that you're talking to your aunt or your uncle or your grandmother or your grandfather. Um, in other words, I, we don't want to slight any of those groups. But in other words, talk to uh, you know, speak as if you're talking to an intelligent uh, relative or friend who doesn't necessarily know much about science or about your particular re research area. So bring it down to a level that you know an intelligent person can understand. So uh, you know, if you want to think of your uncle or your grandmother or grandfather, that that can help. Um, Make sure you give the journalist clear take-home messages. So don't be wishy-washy about what the findings mean. Kind of state clearly what it is that you think that the, that the journalist um, should focus on in their piece. Give them some clear take-home messages. And if you can, try to anticipate any confusions or misinterpretations that the journalist or the lay public might make about your work, especially if it's something controversial. So if you say, well, I, I know this is one way that uh, people might misinterpret the data, if you can just say that to the journalist, like, Here's something that people might misunderstand about my work, and let me tell you why that's wrong. If you tell that to the journalist, they're going to factor that in in crafting their piece. So go ahead and just kind of, uh, you know, think of those and explain those away uh, at the beginning. Anticipate those. Make sure you give a clear statement of the key limitations of your work. The journalist might not ask you for that, but it helps if you can give a clear statement of what are the limitations of your work, what's the context. That will help the journalist in conveying that uh, to the general public so that you know the, the work isn't overblown. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about is just I want you to think carefully about how you present numbers uh, to a general audience or to a journalist. So remember that not everybody uh, is very uh, feels very comfortable with numbers. Uh, people in general are really bad at understanding uh, things like risk. So you want to be careful about how you present numbers and think carefully. Whatever, however you present the numbers to the journalist, they're likely to use those exact numbers in their. Uh, in their report. Unless they're doing some kind of investigative journal journalism, they're likely to just take the numbers that you give them and assume that those are correct and use them in their story. So think about how to present those numbers in a way that's understandable to a general audience. So for example, make units understandable. If you're talking about things like nanometers, most people don't really understand, don't have a conception of that. Is there some way you can make that concrete for, for the journalist and the readers? Um, if you're talking about risks, make sure you present that in the most, those risks in the most transparent, easy to understand way that you can. Again, uh, human beings are really bad at understanding risk. We tend to be, um, you know, very frightened of things that have a very low probability of occurring to us, and we tend to be, you know, not frightened enough about things that are common risks and that are much more likely to occur to us for whatever reason. We just don't have a good conception of, of risks, and this is pretty much true of everyone. So um, presenting risks in a way that's really easy uh, to understand it, it, it is a great uh, public service. And I'm going to just give you a case study here about explaining risks uh, to a journalist or to the lay public. So there's sort of two principles. Keep in mind that for most people, whole numbers are easier to understand than fractions and percents. So you as a scientist probably deal every day with units and fractions and percents, but keep in mind that most people don't deal every day with numbers. And for all of us, whole numbers are always easier to understand than fractions and percents. So think about whether or not you can put your numbers in some way into whole numbers, and I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. Um, in the medical literature, we talk a lot about risks. And uh, a common way of presenting risk in the medical literature is to talk about relative risk. Well, relative risk turns out to be this concept that can be a little bit misleading sometimes because sometimes you can have a very high relative risk even when the absolute risks are low. And so keep in mind that you should try to think about presenting to the journalist or the lay public what are the absolute risks. Not the relative risk, but the absolute risk. So I'm going to give you an example of that as well. So here's a case study. 
that we can talk about. This is a, a case where the, the researchers of this study and, and the people who put out the press release about this study did a really excellent job in describing the risks. I was a, a working as a journalist at the time, and I was particularly impressed when I saw the press release to realize that they actually thought very carefully about how to present the risks, and they presented them with whole numbers and in absolute terms. So this study was the Women's Health Initiative. And this is a large, randomized, double-blind study where they were treating a, a large number of women with postmenopausal hormones and a large number with placebo. And this study answered a lot of questions about postmenopausal hormones. You've probably all heard about it. It was actually halted in 2002. The, the hormonal part of the study was halted in 2002 because uh, hormones were found to significantly increase the risk of breast cancer, which was actually expected. But what was unexpected was that the hormones were found to increase the risk of heart disease, and that was completely unexpected. And so it turned out that they had to halt the study because the, the risks of the hormones turned out to be greater than the benefits. Now, at the time the study was halted, there were 14 million postmenopausal women taking the hormones. So you have to think about delivering this. Um, of course, this was going to be picked up by the media, and the researchers had to think carefully about how to uh, deliver this, uh, this result to the public where they're saying, hey, hormones are bad and there's all these women taking hormones. So how do we put that in a way that's understandable uh, and it's not going to frighten too many people unnecessarily? So, um, so there's a couple of different ways they could have presented the risks in this study. So first of all, there's something called a relative risk. So it turns out that if you looked at this study, the relative risk for invasive breast cancer, so if you compare women who are on hormones to women who are taking placebo, the relative risk, which is made by taking the risk in the hormone group and dividing it by the risk in the placebo group, that turned out to be 1.26. In the, for heart disease, the relative risk turned out to be 1.29. And so the way you interpret those relative risks um, is you would say women who, have, who take hormones have a 26% increased risk of breast cancer and a 29% increased risk of heart disease. Now you have to ask yourself though, is that the best translation for the public? Those relative risks don't tell you what the baseline risk of getting breast cancer or the baseline risk of getting heart disease is. They just tell you that there's a 26% increase in one group relative to the other. So that can be a little bit misleading because those sound like really big increases in risk. But, but think about the numbers in another way. So here were the same results presented as absolute risks. So in that study, it turned out that the risk of invasive breast cancer for women on hormones, their risk was 0.38% per year. So that's a very low risk to an individual woman. If you were on a placebo, the risk was 0.3% per year. So you can see that though, even though that's that 0.38% percent voice versus 0.3% is a 26% increase in risk, it's only in, that's the relative risk increase. In absolute terms, the risk increase is only 0.08% per year. So you can see how much less scary it sounds when you put something in an absolute risk because the absolute risk is low to begin with. So even though you are increasing in a significant amount, the, the risk is still remains low. And for, um, for heart disease, those risks were on hormones, it was 0.37% per year. On placebo, it was 0.3%. So the risk difference was that there was an increase of 0.07% uh, risk per year if you were on the hormones. If you're paying close attention, you might notice that uh, uh, if you divide 0.38 by 0.3, that doesn't quite give you 1.26. And if you divide 0.37 by 0.3, that also doesn't quite give you 1.29. Those relative risks uh, came out of some modeling. So there was a little bit of a statistical adjustment going on. So that's why you get slightly different um, relative risks from those models than you get from just dividing those risks. But they're about, they're roughly the same. So you can see that the risk picture looks a lot different when you look at absolute risk. But again, I told you most people don't understand fractions and percentages very well. So you can actually translate those fractions into whole numbers. So how about if we say the risk of invasive breast cancer, let's put it this way, on hormones was 38 per 10,000 women per year. So 10,000 women who take hormones, 38 of them are going to get breast cancer. For placebo group, there was, it's 30 per 10,000. So 10,000 women who aren't taking hormones, 30 of them will get breast cancer. So what's the risk difference? It's eight additional cases per 10,000 women who take hormones. So that is a much easier way for most people to understand the risk. It uses whole numbers and it's giving you the absolute risk picture. For heart disease, uh, it, you can use the same logic. And it turns out there's seven additional cases per 10,000 women. So seven additional heart attacks per 10,000 women who take hormones.
So you can see this is a much different way to present the risks, and this is a much better way to present the risks to a journalist or to the lay public. So again, the best translation to the public, in that case, I don't think it was this, we, in, in fact, the media didn't present it this way, the 26% increased risk of breast cancer and 29% increased risk of heart disease. That sounds impressive and scary. Fortunately, the researchers uh, who helped write up the press release and the, and the, journal, the, the uh, reporter who wrote up the press release for this study actually did a great job because they didn't put it in those terms. They said, eight more invasive breast cancers per 10,000 women per year and seven more heart attacks per 10,000 women per year. And that's a much more transparent and accurate and less misleading way of presenting the risks. And also, of course, much less scary uh, for the public. The, the results were scary enough for all those women taking hormones. And so this was a much better way to present the risks. So always be very careful and think carefully uh, about how to present numbers uh, and risks. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.